Hello, comic creators. Welcome back to the Comics Connection podcast, where we talk about the business and creative aspects of being a professional comic book creator. My name's Gamal. The gentleman next to me is Andy. And today, Andy, we're talking about a topic that actually covers both the creative and business kind of dimensions of being in comics. And that is the length of your story or format choice. And this discussion comes out of the Comics Pro um, meetings that happened last week where retailers and publishers got together kind of to discuss the state of the industry. It is very similar to a comic book convention in many ways, except there are no fans. There's no cosplay, which means it's probably not as fun. Um, one of the articles that came out from ICV2 talked about how retailers or certain retailers were looking at the trends within the industry and were concerned about a lot of different things. But the one thing that I wanted to focus on today was they were concerned that the industry is moving more and more towards limited series, one shots, um, instead of the traditional ongoing kind of narratives, especially that you see in superhero comics, in manga, where the series kind of runs for dozens and dozens, if not hundreds and hundreds of issues. So before we actually go deep into the discussion, Andy, as a publisher um, and as a reader, is there, when you're looking at a story, when you're looking at you know acquiring something to publish, how does the length of this story impact what it is that is on your mind in terms of acquiring it? Um, well, it, it impacts a couple of different ways. One is, do I think, you know, if we're looking at potentially serializing something like it's a mini series or an mm -hmm. ongoing series or what have you, um, I'm looking at how sustainable I think it will be because there tends to be in single issues, single issue comics that come out, you know, monthly usually. Um, there's a pretty steep sales decline over the first several issues. So mm -hmm. if I look at something and I go, yeah, issue one is going to sell well and do and make some make some money, but by issue four, issue four is losing money because of that sales decline, which is pr fairly predictable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I go, so how many issues is it? Oh, it's six issues. So issues four, five, and six are all going to lose more and more money, which is going to basically going to offset any money that issue one, potentially two and three made. So, you know, if I look at a story, I'm like, this is great, but it's only sustainable over four or over three, then, you know, I mean, it just, it winds up kind of, it, it becomes a business decision um, whether or not I would approve something at that six, right? Now I could go back to the creator and say, this is kind of what we think from a business side of things. What, you know, depending on where they are in the story, obviously if it's finished, it's finished. But, you know, if they're just writing it, then, you know, we could talk about strategies to, you know, shorten it up for, to make it three or four issues or something like that. Um, there's, you know, I'm, I'm not with my own writing. Cause I'm a writer too. Like I don't tend to be super precious with like, no, it has to be 120 pages or nothing. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that I have learned by analyzing story and writing, you know, often I'm asked to write like two length right, mm -hmm. is that stories can expand and contract and it, and it doesn't necessarily have to harm your story to do either one. It can if you do it poorly, but it, but it doesn't have to. So I can get into those discussions. I feel comfortable being in those discussions with creators about, well, if we contract it and we, we do it this way and that way, then the story is still going to be rock solid, still going to be really impactful and it's going to be great and it's not going to be too condensed or crammed or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, that's, that's how those two things, I mean, business and art have always been linked um, and the comics industry is no different. There are creators who either have a following or they don't really, you know, it's not about making money and then they can, they're just making art the way they want to do it. And that's awesome. I wish we all could do that. Um, and, 
you know, I certainly don't have anything against that. And then, you know, on the, on the complete other side of that spectrum, you know, you've got people that are like, these are all the trends. I'm going to design a comic to hit exactly these six points. And, mm. you know, it's not at all about art. So, you know, anywhere on that spectrum, you know, books can be made, but that's how I, that's how I tend to see length, um, impacting or or yeah the business impacting the length or format that's usually the how the conversation goes okay well for everybody who and i probably should have done this before we started going deep into it if for anyone who's not familiar with the different options that are available in comic book length or format or structure I will give a very, very rapid overview about what it is. You could have a comic that is as short as one panel. If you look at things like Far Side or what was that, Lockhorns or anything that was in syndication back when we were much younger, the whole thing, the whole story, for one of if one of a better word, took place in one panel. Um, that is kind of the shortest format for comics. The standard formats that we're talking about in relation to things like the direct market or bookstores is the one shot or the graphic novel, which is can be anywhere from 48 pages to like 480 pages or something like that. And it is a self-contained story, very similar to a standalone novel, except in, you know, sequential narrative art. You have the limited series, which is anywhere between usually four to six issues or like a maxi series was like eight to 12 issues where the self-contained self-contained story is divided into whatever, however many equal parts, four, six, eight, 12. It's usually an even number, not an odd number. And then you have the ongoing series where you're talking about an X-Men, Spider-Man, something like that, where the story in very broad terms, the story may have begun in the 1960s and is still continuing 40, 50, 60 years later. Um, in the article that I'm going to post in the show notes oh, that comes from ICV2 about Comics Pro, they, were, they talked to quite a few retailers who seem to have the position that an ongoing series which the comic book industry, that was kind of the standard model for a very long time, is moving more and more away from ongoing series to limited series and one shots to the detriment of the comic book shops because the comic book shops don't want to actually have to start and stop kind of promoting certain books. They would prefer something that once it started, it continued. So as a following group built up for that book, that following would just continue to come back month after month to get the same story. Um, Andy, you and I were talking before the podcast started about the, the actual reality of comic book shops and ongoing series relative to limited series. So could you explain what it was that you were talking about? uh yeah just it just the the length that there there tends to be that sales decline over over a certain number of issues it's interesting when you were when you were talking about how the ongoing series was the model that actually was a business uh a business thing as well because mm -hmm. like marvel and dc which was originally national um like they only had licenses for they had they were basically given a serial number essentially mm -hmm. for for one title and they only had a certain a handful of titles that they were allowed to put out so they would put out batman or detective comics every month and action comics there was a reason it wasn't originally batman and superman was because mm -hmm. they wanted them to have these broader titles so that they could do different stories with different characters for whatever reason right and then batman was so popular in detective comics number 27 that batman you know kind of took over that book and same thing you know superman was in action number one it was kind of always there but but um <clears throat> but i think it was i think it was marvel was the first one because they only had something like six maybe it was eight i can't remember now so they could only put out eight titles in a in a month that would go to the newsstands and mm -hmm. when one of them wasn't working they would just 
they had to keep the numbering going and they would just swap everything else out, which is how Journey into Mystery became just turned one day into Thor. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so, so there was no Thor number one until like the 1990s or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but anyway, but that's, but it was, I was just sort of thinking, cause we were talking about art versus business and where they intersect and what are, where are the places on that spectrum, but the whole model of the ongoing <laughs> series being the thing was because of bizarro business stuff that like nobody would even think about today um so it's kind of it's kind of i think it's fascinating how how those two things interact but getting back to your your question yeah the the with the sales decline from issue to issue you wind up going okay if issue one is going to do is going to make a thousand dollars issue two will make five hundred dollars issue three makes a hundred dollars issue four is losing a hundred dollars like you know whatever whatever that is i mean that that math isn't you know, obviously that's not the real math, but, um, <clears throat> you know, you just kind of have to look at a project overall. So issue one can make money, but if, if the whole thing could lose money by issue six. Mm-hmm. So one of the things you try to do is kind of go, okay, well, if we're going to, we need four issues to do the story justice, right? What if issue, is it okay if issue four is at that break even point or even loses a little bit of money? Like then I, that I, I would approve that series, Right. Mm-hmm. Because issues one, two, and three are going to make money. Issue four, yeah, sure, it's extra work, but we told the story well and, and, you know, people like it better than, you know, that's those are the kinds of decisions that you wind up making. And because with creator owned comics, which are comics that are owned by the people that create them rather than by the publisher, you know, one of the things that I always try to do is be very transparent in those conversations with the creators and be like, okay, you're going to do this whole fourth issue. Right, you're gonna you're gonna spend at least a month of your life making this comic book that is going to not make any money, mm-hmm. but the whole the thing overall might and 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 if you shorten it to three instead of four issues, that could could hurt the story and you, you may you may not be able to tell the story well, which would be, which is which is not good either. So, those are the kinds of conversations I wind up getting into with creators on a fairly regular basis. Is how do you maximize? And then with a lot of the things that the retailers that are quoted in this article said, and, and it, it, it's worth noting that it's a handful of retailers. It's by no means is this like a retailer conference and then they made some broad statement that every retailer signed off on. That is not what happened. It's just a couple of people that got interviewed. Um, you know, th- their sales, what they're selling and what percentages seem to vary pretty, pretty wildly. Um, And, you know, they're looking the same way that a publishers and the creators are looking to like maximize their, their profit versus their effort. You know, the retailers are trying to do the same thing. And so one of the comments that they had was it, it takes me just as much effort to hand sell a one issue thing that only has one comic for maybe $6 or something like that, as it does for me to sell a mini series that has four comics for $5 each it's it's essentially the one sale but it has a longer tail and it means repeat business mm-hmm. so for them there's this very real math that's sort of the flip side of the math that i was just talking about on the publishing creator side mm-hmm. where they want stuff that's longer because that means that that their customers are going to keep coming back for more bites at that at that apple so there's this mm-hmm. very real tension between what the retailers are looking for and what the publishers and the creators want to want to produce um and it's tough to find a meeting of the minds there because as you minimize your risk as a publisher go i'm going to do this as a one shot well have you minimized your risk because if the retailers don't support it because they're like it's not worth it to try and sell one issue then then you haven't really that's riskier because you don't Mm. have the support on the sell-through side so it sounds like just to, to see if we can put this in context there's a certain amount of tension, potential tension between the creator and the publisher, where the creator wants to tell the story in the best way possible, and the publisher is attempting to maximize the revenue from the release by having the highest possible income and the lowest possible cost to get you the maximum amount of profit. And then there's a tension between the publisher and the retailer at the comic book shop level 
because the comic book shop wants something that this may be too an oversimplification. They want something that's going to sell itself because if people buy, I think the, the quote in the article was, if people buy 62 issues of something, when the 63rd issue comes out, they're just going to buy it. It's not a question of, right. let me see, let me look at the cover, let me see if I, let me check out the story. You already have 62 issues. You're going to get the 63rd one, as opposed to buying three issues of this and four issues of that, and maybe picking up this book. There's much more thought. And since it's all, dis this is, we're all talking about disposable income, there's less, there's less of a inherent need to kind of pick and choose if you don't have to. So if you have those three types of tension, well, two types of tension, creator to publisher and then publisher to retailer. Is there another, do we have any, do you have a sense from a, a just a reader perspective? Because ultimately we, people are not making comic books for the comic book shops. They're making comic books for the reader. Is there a, how do we define the preferences of a reader for yes. ongoing stories as opposed to limited stories as opposed to one shots well uh there are different kinds of readers so mm -hmm. there are those readers that are like i'm i am a spider-man fan right mm -hmm. i have i have a lot i have several friends that are like they're fans of like one comic book character like mm -hmm. I've got one friend that owns, owns every issue of Amazing Spider-Man. He owns all these Spider-Man spinoff titles and he buys a few other things occasionally, but mm -hmm. it, it's Spider-Man through and through. So Marvel can put out all the Spider-Man comics they want and my buddy will buy them. And mm -hmm. that's his, that's his thing. And he, he doesn't love every story that they do, but he likes being the Spider-Man guy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, he, he kind of enjoys having that collection and he, and, you know, and he, and he enjoys being the guy that when I have a Spider-Man question, he's the guy I ask, uh, you know, like, and, and for me, you know, I mean, the closest I ever got to that was, you know, I read X-Men for, I think, well over a decade. Mm -hmm. Like, um, now there weren't 30 X-Men comics every month. There were just one or two during that time, which I could afford. Now I can't. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, I think there, there's, I would say that there's an, there is a third tension, which is the tension between the retailers and the customers, right? The retailers, mm -hmm. like the creators rely to a degree on the publishers to be able to get the, the stuff out there to, mm -hmm. to the, to the wider audiences, right? The publishers are relying on the retailers to buy it from them, but the retailers are relying on their customers, readers, collectors, whomever to buy it from them and so there's a tension there because you know there's always going to be that temptation well i can probably convince him to buy one or two more things that maybe he mm -hmm. won't like as much or she won't like as much or whatever mm -hmm. you know and so there's a tension i think there too um ultimately you know the 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 golden goose right is is something that works for all of, for all of those people you know and, mm -hmm. and I, the example we've all been using for the last decade or so two decades maybe is the walking dead right right which was super popular with readers retailers couldn't get enough of it it was this ongoing series they knew like clockwork they were gonna have people come in every month for the next issue mm -hmm. of walking dead you know the creators were making great money and the, the publisher was too so so when you achieve a level of success all of all of those tensions and those concerns should theoretically go away because you know what we're really talking about are, are like the unknown or i'm trying something out or mm -hmm. it's you know relatively unknown creators or a new new property completely and it's worth noting that when the walking dead launched it was not selling very high numbers at all um i think the print run of issue two or three was like just a couple thousand right. whereas the print run of issue 130 was about 65,000. Right. So it, it, you know, I mean, it took a while for it to catch on and, and take off like that, but, um, but, you know, that's what retailers, I think they'll often say something and they mean it, but, but sometimes, well, this is true of everybody, right? It's not just retailers, but like, you'll say something and there's all this context that maybe you don't put with it. That's just right. all in your head. And I think that happened in some of the, in some of the quotes that are pulled for the article that we're discussing because 
while sure I, ongoing series are great but they're great if they're at that level of success where it's working for mm-hmm. everybody and it and it genuinely impacts their business right, right. but like an ongoing series from a small indie creator that maybe they order one or two of and can sell through is not probably what they're looking for. Because again, the effort to sell those one or two copies each month, they could put that same effort into selling the next issue of X-Men or Superman or Batman or whatever, and they would sell a lot more of those. So again, it would be that, that how much effort am I putting in for how much return am I getting back? And you know, you, you can still be on the wrong side of that equation, even if you are putting out an ongoing series. So, mm. you know, I always try to, you know, whenever there's stuff with the retailers or there's stuff with other publishers or creators talking about what they want from publishers or from retailers or whatever, I try to always look at kind of what's behind the statement, like what's really mm. going on there. And, and um, you know, I mean, I think if, I think if Marvel just said, hey, we're going to stop doing all these X-Men miniseries, the Spider-Man miniseries, and, Mar- and DC, we're like, we're not going to do Batman miniseries and one shots, and we're not going to do Superman miniseries. Like, at first, there'd be real interest in that because there's fewer titles and they can just sell more of those. But overall, retailers, I think, would be unhappy because they do rely on selling those other franchise materials. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the most successful things I think that, that, um, Marvel did was when they started double shipping in the early 2000s with some of their more popular titles he put out maybe 18 issues of ultimate spider-man which was a huge Mm -hmm. seller for them at the time out and that worked they didn't see any sales drop off fans of ultimate spider-man were like great we get one and a half as much of this thing that we love um you know and then they did something similar with amazing spider-man where it was coming out i think three times uh, three times a month Mm -hmm. um instead of one issue of amazing spider-man one issue of sensational spider-man and one issue of web of spider-man or whatever the third one was at the time Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. You know, they were just all amazing Spider-Man. They all just continued one issue to the next. I think, I think there was some success to that because those titles had that sort of legitimacy to them, and it and it was the thing that the readers wanted. So there's lots of like games and sort of tricks you can play, but um, but I think one of the things that gets missed is there has to be some level of I don't know what the right word is here, but like genuine attempt at doing the the thing right like it's not enough just to put out more product like that doesn't actually help anybody long run but if you can Mm -hmm. put out amazing spider-man comics more often at the same high quality rate then retailers are going to like that and probably the spider-man fans are going to like that too um you know it's just kind of that's i mean and i don't think that's unique to comics right i mean we saw that with the marvel movies Right. You know, which the more they put out, the the bigger they got until at some point viewers stop going. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you reach you reach a critical mass. And the other the other thing that I think in not just the length of the story or the length of the story arc, but the there was some mention in the article of the timing in between or the delays in between um certain runs so that even if you have an ongoing series and this is much more relevant to small or mid-sized publishers or emerging publishers than like a marvel or a dc that you might have a plans for 80 issues 100 issues but they're all going to come out in four to six issue arcs and from a production standpoint you need time to actually get the story together, get the thing printed, get the thing out the door. So it can't come out every single month. You may have four issues that come out or six issues that come out one year. And then eight months later, you ramp up again and you have another arc. And I think that kind of production schedule is more realistic for the smaller publishers who can't just constantly turn out product. But it seems like the retailers, or at least some of the retailers feel like, that that gap between like let's say issue four and issue five because it's you know it's going to be a new arc that's losing them readers or that's losing them business because they need that continual flow to actually make that work do i don't think that makes sense do you um i mean i think i do the retailers need the continual Mm -hmm. 
reliable flow. I mean, it it makes sense to me again on those certain high selling, long running titles. Yeah. Mm. Um, on the the flip side of that, what you were saying is like a series of mini series that takes time in between. I mean, a lot of a lot of times I hear that referred to as the Hellboy model. Um, yes. Hellboy is a book for for those listening that may not know. Hellboy is is a is a book by Mike Mignola and Mike up until relatively recently he did the writing and the art and pretty much everything but the lettering himself um and so yeah i mean he couldn't he couldn't keep a monthly schedule so mm -hmm. he would do one story arc and then he'd take a he'd be keep working but he'd have to bank up a bunch of, mm -hmm. of pages or issues and then he'd release it again and but you know the thing that doesn't get talked about a lot when people discuss how that worked for Hellboy is that um, Mike has such a unique style and such a loyal fan following for mm. what he does and how he does it that, you know, he was never losing readership. If anything, he was just gaining readers as he, as he went along, um, which is very rare. Like, mm -hmm. And because something is a success for one miniseries doesn't mean that two or three miniseries later it will continue to be just because. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I think you know, it's at some point like if you reach franchise status, like it, and Walking Dead is really the only the only property I can think of that that fairly organically you know went from being this like little indie book that nobody heard of to being like hey that's pretty popular like hey this is cool i'll start checking it out i remember the first issue the first issue i bought of that was i think issue 10 or 11 because i just started hearing good things about it and so i mm -hmm. picked it up and then there was a trade paperback that collected the first five or six issues or something like that and i picked that up um it just built momentum right and it's the only thing i can think of there's probably others that i've seen that started off as this really like indie thing and and grew quickly but not overnight it didn't like explode onto the scene and then the tv show certainly was a big blip it was a big hit and then you had all the merchandise and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. going on and and walking dead is i mean there's i don't think you could make an argument that it's not a franchise it's got like three spinoff tv shows now and all that kind of stuff whereas most of the other things that we think of as franchises you know, like Star Wars, like that first movie came out and it was an overnight success and an overnight franchise practically. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very, very difficult to get that kind of organic growth. Um, to work. Yeah, I think the only other, the only other thing in recent history and it's arguable that you would say this is recent history would be like Turtles. Yeah, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles would 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 be that. Yeah, I mean, I remember reading that before anybody knew what it was, and mm -hmm. then the cartoon came out, and I was like, "This isn't like the violent, bloody comics I read." <laughs> they don't talk about pizza. Yeah, yeah, well, that's that's the magic of media crossover. We could make it anything we want to make it. Yeah, but to to kind of wrap up the discussion here, if you're a a creator who's trying to figure out how long your story should be or what format your story should be in. Um, my recommendation is first to be very kind of true to your story. Stories can be told in any, any size that you want or any length that you want, but I would not recommend attempting to make a story longer just for the sake of making the story longer. Um, if there's a story that you want to tell that has a beginning, middle, and end, and it lasts for four issues, then there's no point trying to make that 300 issues. Um, so that's the first part, staying true to the narrative and what the narrative actually needs in terms of length. The second point is to take a look at your marketing and distribution. What is it that your potential readers, what is it how do they like to consume stories? What story lengths do they like to um, read? And then attempt to cater to that. Again, with your distribution channels, if you're mostly in the bookstore market or that's where you decided you want to be, you don't necessarily have to worry about ongoing narratives because that's not how those books were sold anyway. If you're doing webtoons, it's the same thing. 
in reverse, where you kind of need to have 50, 60 episodes already in the bank before you even start releasing it because their continuity is very important. So the narrative choices are the first you know, major thing. And then just your readers and where you plan to help them read the book is going to help you figure out where you can control your costs and where you could actually, how you could actually make the type of book that you need to make. Andy, does that make sense? Do you have anything to add? That makes sense. The only thing I would add is, is I do tend to look at comp titles, like similar mm -hmm. titles, whether it's genre or similar, you know, popularity of creator or the length of the book of what I think it mm -hmm. might be, um, that kind of thing. And then I'll look at variations of that. So if somebody mm -hmm. comes to me and says, I want to do a, a 120 page graphic novel in the fantasy, high fantasy, like Lord of the Rings type style thing. Great. I can look, I can easily look up other books and see how they've how they've done you know have they had multiple volumes that's a good indicator that the first one worked um you know or but then i'll also go and look like well what if it was instead of 120 pages what if it was like 80 pages at mm -hmm. a lower price point and then i'll try and look up some of those so i'll look up as much as i can now when it comes to to trades and books and that sort of thing um you know i have uh, a, a book scan account so i can look up actual sales of books um, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have that but um, but even with the comics if you're looking at north american comics you can get a good idea there are some free resources out there to to look at how sales did of comics and you know again get get you a get a ballpark of what the thing is you're kind of gonna try and do um there's probably something out there that is similar enough <laughs> to give you an idea of, of what kind of sales you can you can hope for. Yeah. Now, we have talked in the past that the sales numbers or sales estimates in comics are not necessarily the most reliable things in the world unless you have like a book scan account which actually covers very accurately one segment of distribution, but yeah, having an idea of what similarly situated books and stories have done and how they have worked will help you from, you know, going into the whole thing blind and not really understanding what it is that you are getting into in terms of deciding whether your book should be a one shot, a limited series, an ongoing series, a graphic novel, a web comic, or whatever. So that's, and those, those actual um, concepts and those, the, options that you have are constantly changing. So one of the things that we talk about a lot in the discussions of at In Commerce Connection is how do you actually, as the industry evolves, how do you actually change what it is that you're doing so that it makes sense for the industry? We're going to continue to have those conversations in our weekly meetups at Commerce Connection. So we're going to drop a link in the show notes. So if you want to check out Commerce Connection and get your first free month. So until the next time, thank you for listening. I'm Gamal. He's Andy. And have fun with your cop.